Good afternoon, um, everybody, or good evening, depending on where you are, and welcome. Uh, I am Yulia Joja, Senior Fellow at the Middle East Institute's Frontier Europe Initiative, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's um, discussion and event on economic security in the Black Sea region, focusing on internal and external challenges that we deal with. MEI's Frontier Europe Initiative explores um, Black Sea as a key region for transatlantic security and development. And with today's event um, that is part of our effort um, for Black Sea security and dialogue, we look at the emerging market um, economies in the Black Sea region, including specifically Turkey, Ukraine, and Georgia, um, that all of them, um, those and, and the others in the region are facing significant um, economic challenges amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, such challenges are impacting, impacting the overall security of um, these countries and um, in the security in the wider region. Um, in the Black Sea, Economically, we deal with major disparities in terms of size of the countries, but also in terms of um, EU versus non-EU territory, EU and international foreign investment disparities among non-EU countries in the Black Sea region, and significantly varying domestic environments for investment. Um, so we have today a difficult task um, assessing some of these challenges and the investment environment in a region with um, great diversity and with significant challenges also in the current context. I am thrilled to be joined today um, by uh, Altai Alti, um, who is the founder and manager of Istanbul-based um, advisory firm Alti Global, um, as well as Panayotis Gavras, um, who is the head of policy and strategy department at the Black Sea Trade and Development Bank. Anthony Kim, um, who is an editor um, focused on the index of Economic Freedom at the Heritage Foundation and Mamuka Tseretelli, who is a non-resident with us at Frontier Europe, as well as a senior fellow at uh, Central Asia Caucasus Institute at American Foreign Policy Council. To read um, our, uh, our participants, uh, panelists, um, full bios, um, please um, visit MEI's website where you can see all the details. And um, to our audience, um, I look forward to taking audience questions through Zoom's Q&A feature, which you can all find on your screen. Screens. For those um, calling in by phone or watching our panel on the live stream, you can ask a question by emailing events at mei.edu or tweeting us at MEI Frontier. Um, and also, if you have any technical issues, please email e events at mei.edu. Um, please feel free to ask questions anytime throughout the panel. I'll be looking forward to your questions and will factor as many um, into the conversation as, as possible. And um, with, um, without further ado, as we have only um, one, uh, one hour of this discussion, I'd like to um, open the floor um, to our initial presentations from, from our distinguished panelists today, um, starting with um, Mamuka. If you can give us um, a brief um, overview of the issues um, of economy and investment in the current environment in the Black Sea. Thank you, Yulia, and uh, 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 welcome to our guests and uh, other panel participants. Thanks for your participation in this discussion. I'll be very brief. brief. Uh, we all know that Black Sea is attracting increasingly uh, more attention uh, uh, from all around the world and obviously from Europe and uh, surrounding areas. And uh, I think uh, this attention is mostly focused on security related issues, but today we are here to discuss economic security uh, factors that impact countries of the Black Sea area, which is obviously in a very uh, close correlation with general security as well as sovereignty of these countries. And because of the legacy of uh, Soviet Union in some countries and uh, being the part of the Eastern Bloc uh, in some of the countries of the, of the Western part of the Black Sea region, as well as um, uh, multiple factors that impacted the last 20 to 30 years developments. Most of these countries are emerging economies. They all are emerging and more uh, economies in many ways. And that they all face uh, multiple challenges of transition from centrally planned economies to uh, free market economies. 
uh, even Turkey, which is obviously <clears throat> a very significant economic actor in this region and uh, uh, in many ways public goods provider for some of other neighboring countries in terms of trade and, and uh, employment and so forth, uh, went uh, through significant transition in the last uh, couple of decades in terms of economic transition and so forth. But challenges are, are uh, as well shared by these countries. And uh, uh, while overall economic development and transition in, in the, towards this market economy was difficult, it's obviously the difficulties are amplified by COVID-19 and all the <clears throat> related problems uh, that occurred in economies of these countries. So I would say that the, uh, there are two major challenges that we are facing. One is overall security, I mean, for this region. Overall security, which is and geopolitical realities that uh, that complicates uh, natural, I would say, economic development of these countries. Uh, conflict between um, uh, Russia and Georgia, Russia, conflict between Russia and Ukraine, uh, occupation of the territories, closure of the sea access uh, in Azov Sea and some other areas obviously prevent natural development of, of a natural flow of cargoes, natural flow of goods, and also movement of people. So that's geopolitical factor, and I'm sure will, will be mentioned here uh, at least several times to today's discussion. But uh, there's also another challenge, which is the government policies, how governments are handling overall economic development, also how they are handling uh, the COVID-19 and related issues. Uh, there was a major focus on government policies in last uh, uh, several, uh, actually more than one year now, uh, and uh, primary focus was on government, uh, how government was dealing with the uh, COVID uh, pandemic and related health uh, issues and so forth. But I think we are increasingly moving to, uh, to the uh, point when we need to focus more on the private sector development, private sector input in in uh, in economic development so that uh, so that countries really start recreating jobs and recovering from difficulties that they uh, they faced in last uh, last year or two um, some countries are more affected as Julia you mentioned obviously uh, countries that are uh, more dependent on on tourism and uh, recreation and so forth are facing major problems Again, conflict and geopolitics impacts uh, other countries, but clearly we see also resilience among these countries. And they have, uh, because of macroeconomic policies in some of them already pre-existing to, uh, to COVID, as well as overall, uh, at least benefits of last 20 to 30 years developments after collapse of Soviet Union was that countries know more or less how to handle their economic difficulties. And that's that's uh, pretty pretty helpful in this in these difficult times. So uh, without further probably delay on on uh, on on overall situation, I would like to probably go, go back to you and uh, continue this discussion with other panel participants. Thank you, Mamuka, and thank you for highlighting some of the challenges that we're facing in in the current context of um, focusing um, also from the United States perspective and and the aid that it provides um, internationally and to the region on on governance policy. And while that um, uh, is likely to remain a focus um, under the Biden administration, um, I do want to underline something that you said that. Um, um, now with the recovering of economies, we see it first and foremost in the West, but um, with vaccines rolling in, um, we um, we are hoping and we're expecting that this will lead to an economic um, significant um, uh, development, if not boom in the region as well, um, particularly through, um, through pri private investment, which is something that um, regionally we haven't focused um, enough um, in, in the last um, few years. So um, this is a, a great segue to to our conversation today and with that i'd like to um to uh, pass the floor um to panayotis who um with his experience at the black sea trade and development bank has been looking for uh, many years um into um the investment environments um in the region and the challenges that um that the region overall faces um panayotis the floor is is yours if you could um give us an overview um from your perspective um from the bank um on on the the current challenges and opportunities in the region. Thank you very much, Yulia, and thank you to Mamuka and the rest of you for, uh, at the Middle East Institute for putting this event on today. 
and for the opportunity to speak. It's been a while since people have focused on economic security issues in the region. I think it's always pertinent. As Mamuka said, geopolitics tends to usually dominate the discussion. We don't have a lot of time here, so I'm gonna, and I have a lot of information. I'll try to get through it. And obviously there's a presentation which I'll be sharing. Um, hopefully you can all see it. If you can't, now's the time to tell me. Um, and I wanna provide you with an overview of the region. Just before we get started, let me say that I work for the Black Sea Train Development Bank. We're a small sub-regional development bank focused on economic cooperation and promotion of economic development in the Black Sea region. It's not always an easy task, as you can imagine. Um, we're very small. We have a balance sheet of about three and a half billion dollars and a project portfolio of around two and a half billion dollars. But we've grown over the years and we are present in all of these countries. And in fact, in the broader sense, in the broader white uh, Black Sea region, as we stretch from the Adriatic and Albania through the Black Sea region, all the way to the Caspian, because Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, they are also our member states. 90% of our economies though are in the Black Sea region. So what you see below is very indicative of what's going on in the region. Um, the only major sized economy that we cover that would not be covered today is Greece. Everyone else is, is a Black Sea littoral state basically. Let me start with 2020, if I may. Um, you can see that the region did uh, suffer a downfall, but it was much worse, much less bad than had been feared originally. We're talking about numbers on the order of minus six, minus seven, even worse. Um, and relative to the rest of the world, it actually fared reasonably well. The recession was somewhat milder um, than we have seen uh, elsewhere. Um, the region did manage through the first two pandemic waves at different ways and in different um, among the countries. Um, but it does seem to be on a path of recovery now, although, as we always pr present this caveat, uncertainties remain high in the region. Um, all but one experience of contraction. Turkey is the exception, which had a small marginal still growth, but still much lower than the high growth rates that it had experienced in previous years. One unique feature of this crisis, and um, sarp contrast to the 2008-2009 uh, global financial crisis, which affected the region quite severely, was that in this case, the region had the headroom to act. Um, obviously, it was facilitated in this by the incredible flood of liquidity from the quantitative easing of the European Central Bank and the Fed and all of that. Um, and they also had backing from the IMF, from the ECB, um, in terms of swap and repo lines and rapid credit facilities and all that. But really, it was striking that the region had the headroom to follow expansionary fiscal and monetary policies, um, and even to purchase government bonds and do some quantitative easing, something which was unthinkable back in 2008 when a lot of these economies had been um, overheating. This is not unique. Other emerging markets also borrowed more cheaply than ever um, and, and uh, at very, very favorable rates. Um, but the Black Sea region seems to fare quite well in this respect. Um, and you can see in this slide here that whereas it was far below the um, the fiscal measures, this focused on the fiscal measures that the region took, um, it was slightly above the average for emerging market um, economies. There's a great deal of variety there, ranging from around 2% uh, to a little bit over 15%. But by, and you can see that the wealthier countries tended to spend more, although in the case of Russia and Romania, they really didn't, and they probably could have done a little bit more in that respect. Um, but this gives you an indication of how they fared and the room that they had to, to work on with around 7% of GDP going in. This slide here shows the region um, over the last few years, um, and you can see the projection for of minus 2.4 last year, and what we see being a recovery over the next couple of years, and more than fully recovering for the loss that, that was experienced um, last year due to the um, pandemic. Um, so we're looking at growth for about 3% this year, but going beyond that, the region will be hard pressed to sustain growth above 3%. We see them in the two to 3% range. And that's a legacy actually of the previous crisis, not the current one. Um, countries, because of what they had suffered back then, have made a very conscious decision to sacrifice growth for the sake of reduced vulnerability, to fix their fiscal budgets, to reduce their debt levels, to be much more conservative in their credit expansion and things like that. And that has worked very well, and that's what allowed them to do things um, that they would have, um, you know, all these fiscal and, uh, measures last year. However, it also means that they've suffered from underinvestment for a number of years. Um, and that has taken a toll both on actual growth and on their longer term growth potential. And I single out Georgia and Turkey as two relative exceptions, but this is very much the case for the other countries that um, we are discussing today, um, including also Russia, um, uh, 
Romania somewhat, Bulgaria certainly, uh, and some of the other countries. Clearly, there are risks that are out there um, in terms of if global conditions change and things like that. But it's important to note that right now, no country in the Black Sea region is in imminent danger of uh, sort of a sovereign default, something that which they have experienced over the course of the last decade or two. Um, but right now, the risks are primarily in the very poorest economies in places like Africa um, and in parts of uh, South America. Um, so solvency is not an issue, although unfettered access to affordable liquidity is, and that may be something to discuss further in our discussion later on. You can see in this slide how credit ratings have evolved. Um, the region suffered uh, after the in the aftermath of the crisis, this is for all of Eastern Europe, but it covers the countries we're talking about today to a great extent, and they're very, very typical of what we're seeing here. Um, and in the last few years, they've actually done much better. There have been more upgrades than downgrades um, throughout the region. And in 2020, this continued, interestingly enough, despite the sharp downfall, um, most of the countries either held their ratings, they held their outlooks. Um, in one or two cases, there were even upgrades, and there was only one case of a downgrade. So they fared reasonably well in that respect. Because we're looking at trade and investment today, I want to share with you a few thoughts on that as well. Um, after the two, I mean, the, the previous dec the two decades ago, 2000s, the noughties, as we say, um, the region boomed in every respect, both respect to trade and investment. The crisis of 2008 had a big impact, um, and whereas trade recovered, we see that investment never really did, both domestic investment and foreign direct investment. Um, and you'll see actually in the next slide um, where right now um, remittances have actually proven to be a more stable source of inflows than investment and other sources of flows which had been coming in once upon a time and have, removed, and have proven much more volatile. I think it's important to point out that the regional banking systems um, are, in re are in quite good shape right now. Um, They've grown in depth, they've grown in sophistication, they've reduced their non-performing loans. They are by and large, and there are maybe an exception or two that we can talk about, but by and large, they're in quite good shape. And tighter regulation and much more conservative um, management has played a role in doing that. Um, the biggest problem really, and Mamuka alluded to this, and I fully subscribe to this, is um, deteriorating east-west geopolitics um, and the whole thing about sanctions, which cre has created a lot of uncertainties. Um, as the biggest sort of unknown when we're looking at the region and its outlook. Here's a slide on trade. It goes up to 2020 and it shows how trade has ebbed and flowed. Um, the lines that you see, and I think they are maybe a little bit more interesting, they've shown a general declining trend and that's with respect to intra-regional trade. The big dip that you see here around 2014 and 15 is actually because of the, 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 the substantial drop in Russia-Ukraine trade relations, which was the biggest trade relationship we had in the region and has undergone a major transformation as a result of the conflict that we have seen. But by and large, the region um, trade flows within the region have been very limited and the upward trend that we saw during the boom years has never really replicated itself. I spoke a little bit about remittances versus foreign direct investment, and I like this slide a lot. Even though it's not up to date, we don't have 2020 figures yet for remittances, it does show that remittances tend to be much more stable source of inflows um, and have held up much better than foreign direct investment, which has been all over the place. It boomed and it reached up to 4 to 5% of regional uh, GDP. And last year it fell, I mean, it crushed quite a bit and fell to 1% levels we haven't seen in almost 20 years. We don't know where remittances will be. Um, they will certainly probably go down also, but they seem to have held up much better than other sources of financing. So let me um, conclude with this last slide and provide a little bit of food for thought. Um, Mamuka mentioned resilience, and I think that's a very important word to keep in mind when talking about this region, because there are a lot of uncertainties. The countries have adjusted accordingly and have learned to live with this. Um, the post-2009 you know, tighter regulation is one of it. The solid macroeconomic management is another. Um, you know, even though Turkey is in the, in the news for a lot of things, uh, for a lot of the wrong reasons right now economically, um, the risk of endogenous crisis is actually relatively limited. I know some people may disagree with that when we talk about some of the countries, but um, they really are in much, they are in on fairly solid footing, even though they will have fiscal deficits and growing debts that have emerged from the pandemic to deal with. They do have the support mechanism and they've shown in the past 
that they've um, they're very resilient and able to adjust to situations. And even Turkey, when people talk about them, I mean, politically, it would be very damaging. But they're actually one phone call away from the IMF from um, really going back. Um, I don't know if they would ever do that. Um, but one phone call to the IMF and getting a program from there would go a long way towards reducing a lot of what the people fear right now about that. Um, the deteriorating East-West politics is the big problem. Um, sanctions have played a huge role. We've seen a weaponization of that. Um, we've seen other elements of it um, in terms of access to financing. Um, and you see a lot of the countries, one of the reasons that for instance, Russia is so keen on de-dollarization is because they see it as a vulnerability reduction mechanism. So that's um, that's really, uh, in, in terms of uncertainties, that's one of the biggest problems. Um, in terms of the region's opportunities, um, they are there. The business environments are fairly solid. They're much improved relative to where they were before. And you still have a region that has low cost and high skill levels. Another thing, and we don't know how this is gonna play out, and it'll be interesting to hear from the other panelists, their views, is that this region's location, geostrategically important, is also from a, is at a crossroads economically as well. Um, and there is a lot of capacity here for production in countries like um, Turkey and Romania. And if we do see a shift in global supply chains to shorten shipping lanes and to reduce vulnerabilities, some of the countries in this region really stand to benefit from that sort of a thing. Although that's a big if, and we don't know how that's gonna play out because everybody was talking about that last year. And now we see again, that a lot of stuff has fallen back to where it was. Nevertheless, it's something to keep in mind. Um, biggest problem for the region for me is the negative perceptions that uh, exist and they do impose very high opportunity costs. But having said that, you know, where there's a challenge, there's also an opportunity and you know, we do believe that there are very significant opportunities for growth um, presented by increasing trade at the regional level. Um, there's lots of investment opportunities, and there's clearly a lot of potential to grow further. Um, thank you. That's it for me, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Panayotis, for this fantastic overview. My takeaway from that, and, and maybe we can, if we have time, go back to that um, question um, later on, is um, the relationship between, on one side, underinvestment in the region, particularly from the West, um, in the context of um, geopolitics and the reduction of um, of regional trade because of sanctions on both sides, if you think about Russia also imposing sanctions um, on, on regional countries and regional economies. And on the other side, um, the conservative spending as a consequence, as a long-term consequence of the, of the big financial crisis, 2008, 2009. Um, so um, with that in mind, with that um, difficult balance, maybe that's something that um, is food for thought and, and worth revisiting how we can take um, that on and, and uh, consider um, a further um, regional economic development based on a relationship that builds into, into our Western ties, um, but also on, on, on regional um, uh, trade um, uh, as, as a building block um, to further development. Um, with that, I'd like to, to pass the floor um, to Anthony, um, who um, has been, uh, whose work is focused Focus on um, the index of economic freedom um, and um, uh, Panayotis, if you could unshare your screen. Um, uh, and, uh, um, and I'd like to ask um, Anthony if you can give us an overview of um, where the countries are at the moment, um, what the, the challenges are in terms of real numbers, and how we can take that on um, in, in, in terms of lessons learned for some of these countries um, to rebuild their economies in the near future. Thank you, Julia, for sure. So let me join Julia by saying good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are. It's always great to be with uh, you know, MEI, Middle Eastern uh, Institute, and then um, especially Frontier Europe, and also my good friend Mamuka. So when Mamuka and MEI asked me to do something together, that's a definite yes. So let me, I was given like 10 minutes, but let me make you super happy and excited. I'll just use seven minutes to be lucky. So I'll be quick and brief. Let me share my bottom line message as well. You know, Julia, Mamuka, they mentioned frontier, emerging, you know, ongoing changes. Black Sea region, more than ever, it's emerging and it's really greater frontier uh, uh, parts of the world we need to focus on. If I may, 
we got to transform Black Sea region as a blue ocean region where we can really realize concrete opportunities. And that's why we are doing this virtual conference together. And by all means, this is only the one portion of our discussion. I mean, Black Sea deserves more than one hour for sure. So this is only the tip of our conversation. We're going to have more. So I'll be very quick, but you know my bottom line. Bottom line is that this is time to work together to make our rebound. I'm, I'm talking about our rebound, Washington and Black Sea regions. We got to work together. There are so many evolving pieces. We got to really pay attention to. So let me allow to share. Uh, allow me to share my uh, um, presentation here. And as I said, you know the the event we are doing today together is really about challenges, as the title of the event suggests, external and internal. But the bottom line is very straightforward. No matter what, how we look at the region. Economic freedom matters to the region, uh, especially advancing economic freedom. So that's why I want to set a few parameters for the greater discussions for today and later on. And let's recognize that, you know, what a twisted year we've just been through. 2020, so many different levels, uh, politically, economically, especially in terms of public health, was simply unacceptable, unpleasant. But we are going through this and we're strong humans. So we're going to get through this either through vaccines or any other whatever, you know, uh, measures uh, we are putting together. So I'm confident that, you know, uh, this third crisis, third global crisis we are going through in this 21st century, we're going to get through this. Uh, first, we had a security crisis in 2001. And after 10 years, we had a 2009, 10 global financial crisis. And now we are going through this public global public health crisis. But once again, I'm confident that, you know, we're going to get through this uh, as soon as we can. And that's why all the more today's occasion is very important. So bottom line message, once again, you know, however numbers crisis we are going through, bottom line is really the open free market democracy matters. As you can see in this quick chart, as we improve our economic freedom, global GDP as a world, as a whole, we've been- Anthony, sorry for interrupting. Um, if you can share your screen, we cannot see the presentation yet. How about now? Yes, perfect. Go on, please. Okay, sorry. So, uh, as you can see here, as we improve our economic freedom, global economy as a whole, we've been uh, increasing the pie. So that means we have more opportunities and more economic uh, benefits and global, a greater global cooperation. That means reducing the poverty. But the more important uh, message I think we should keep in mind that where we should work together. If you look at our index, we have basically four important pillars, a rule of law, government size and regulatory efficiency and open markets. They all constitute economic freedom uh, collectively. But as you can see, we see some red lines here and there, but especially rule of law. I think that's where the Black Sea region's uh, suffering and not only the Black Sea region, but globally overall. So that's the one area we need to pay greater attention to as we move forward. Bottom line, once again, this is really about institutional capacity. So let's dive into our you know, focus of the discussion, Black Sea. I just you know, used our map here. Obviously, as you can see, it's a very uh, important strategic uh, location uh, in terms of uh, connecting Europe and you know, Asia even, and the Middle East. So you know, Ukraine, unfortunately, it's a huge country with a greater potential, but it hasn't been up to that uh, level of realizing economic potentials. And that's why Ukraine's uh, color is quite different from other countries in the region. But Georgia has been leading in terms of economic freedom rankings, but let's keep in mind, Georgia and also Romania, uh, they are relatively small countries. So they need a greater market, they need a greater supply chain, they need a greater capacity. And that's where uh, like a Turkey and Ukraine and other countries can come in but again, we are talking about here internal as well as external challenges. 
economic security is not always straightforward, clean cut issues. There's always geopolitical dimension, like an external threat. And that's coming from Russia in this case. We cannot really talk about Black Sea region without talking about Russia. So I put Russia in our, in our little map here. But as you can see, uh, Russian economy has not been doing well. It's below Turkey, it's below many other countries. But the, the, the common challenge here is very simple. This is really time to up the game to realize greater economic opportunities that are available to many of these countries. And once again, Washington and these allies and friends in the region, we should work together to come up with a very concrete roadmap to greater prosperity. And I just wanna share the quick overview in terms of uh, progress, because it's one thing that, you know, you have a higher level of economic freedom, but what's the progress? As you can see, I just chose four key countries for the, today's discussion, Georgia, Romania, Turkey, Ukraine. You know where they are in terms of their economic freedom and economic competitiveness. But as you can see, overall direction is moving upward and, and, and positive direction. Again, we are looking at more than two decades of time frame here, 27 years. So I think that's a positive message. It's not really going backward. I mean, look at Ukraine. The country has been suffering from many different multiple level uh, crises, internal, external. Nonetheless, in recent years, it's been bouncing back. My only hope that is how we can accelerate this positive progress as we get into post-pandemic recovery and post-pandemic world. So that's again, well, once again, I think you know countries like Georgia, Romania, Turkey, Ukraine, despite the differences, I think especially when it comes down to trade and investment issue, I think we can talk about something uh, more constructive and forward looking as we go. This is my last slide, why it matters. This is a very simple uh, chart that shows the relationship between free market policies, economic freedom and greater prosperity. But when you talk about, when you think about prosperity, it's not really about how much money you have. This is really about overall well-being stability, competitiveness, and resilience, and overall security, not only economic security, but also overall capacity of the country and the region. So a lot of um, you know, Black Sea countries we've been touching upon, they are somewhere here. The direction we wanna go is up here. And I showed you the direction, general direction, the countries in the Black Sea are heading, led by Georgia. So. A lot of turbulence internally, given you know, what's happening in Georgia. Romania had a lot of elections over the past years. And Turkey, obviously, I don't have to talk about all the details. You guys fully informed. And obviously, Ukraine, another phase of turbulence, hopefully not long, not prolonged. But this is a turbulence we need to get through together. Again, I think this is time for us to work together, how to make Black Sea region really blue ocean of opportunities we can realize. All the more, I think Washington's role is important. I'm excited to see the three C's initiatives and other discussions. Obviously, this is not something out of the blue. This is, has been something that we've been talking about. Let's not forget about China and its growing diplomatic uh, strategic influence into the region. If we do not act right now, when we're going to miss the uh, prime opportunity. So this is time to work together, think together, act together. And we're going to do a lot more as we move forward. So this is my background setter and I look forward to our discussions. Thank you, Anthony. This has been uh, this has been like um, uh, um, a presentation of the Black Sea as a bit of a miracle in, in the end when it comes to how many challenges we have geopolitically. You can see the countries as, as you've shown us on an upward trend despite everything going on, including sanctions, including economic choking and, and everything. But I think um, my takeaway from that is that um, uh, from, from what you've said um, that rule of law um, and, and, and governance um, uh, overall um, is the key um, to further cooperation and bringing more, uh, more of the, um, the United States and the West overall into the region. So um, basically we are dealing
dealing with um, uh, hand in hand on one side, attracting foreign investment, making uh, um, increasing economic freedom in, in some of these countries, um, but at the same time doing that with care, also um, bearing um, or, or uh, referring to your last comment on China, where we've seen over the last um, few years, especially under the, uh, the Trump administration, but likely to continue the United States actively stepping into the Black Sea um, to compensate for um, China that has been perceived as the only version or the only alternative to Russia in terms of, of strategic investments with the United States now increasingly stepping in with significant investments in, in Romania and hopefully um, in, uh, in Bulgaria and other countries in the region as well. So. Um, that's kind of the, the positive takeaway. Um, let's see where we, uh, where we are heading in, in the next few years. And with that, I'd like to turn um, the floor to, um, to give the floor to Altai, um, we, um, who can focus us a little bit on, on Turkey as um, one of the major um, economies and economies on the rise um, in the region in terms of power, and, but also in terms of um, uh, investments that it attracts and, and, and domestic um, investment as well. Um, can you give us um, an overview of, of your understanding of what is going on um, in Turkey economically and also what um, uh, consequences that has for regional trade and, and regional development outside? Sure, Julia, and thank you very much. Uh, and a big thank you to the Middle East Institute and the Frontier Europe Initiative uh, as well for having me. I, uh, let me start with a, a brief, a quick overview of the Turkish economy during the pandemics. As Panayotis mentioned, Turkey has actually managed to grow uh, even marginally yet, uh, but still there was a positive growth in, uh, in the pandemic year. And uh, but it's important to note that uh, the drivers of this growth have been uh, uh, especially household spending and government spending. So these were the main uh, drivers. Uh, plus, uh, so uh, we continue to spend money uh, in a nutshell uh, as uh, consumers and also at the government uh, level. Uh, but also there was high performance in certain services sectors, which were actually positively affected by the uh, pandemic, like financial services, like digital trades, IT, ICT in general. These were also on the positive. What was on the negative was exports uh, mainly. Turkish imports have increased uh, during the pandemic year, 2020, but Turkey's exports uh, uh, in the same year has gone down by 15% uh, during the year. Uh, now, when we come to, uh, to the current day, uh, we are almost at the middle uh, of the 2021, uh, there are some positive developments and some not so positive developments regarding the Turkish economy. Now, on the good news side, uh, manufacturing uh, is going uh, stronger than expected. If you look, for example, at the PMI numbers, the P P Purchasing Managers Index, uh, they are above uh, 50 and increasing, which is a sign of a healthy uh, progress. Uh, industrial production is uh, increasing, and there's, there, and I think there are two things about this. Uh, one thing is on the demand side, the global recovery is affecting uh, exports positively, and therefore production within Turkey. But also uh, on the supply side, uh, the measures taken by the government, uh, I mean, the lockdowns, the measures uh, like curfews, lockdowns, they have always included uh, you know, possibilities for companies, for factories uh, and so on to continue their production. So if you are, for example, working in a, a factory, if you are working in production, you are exempt uh, from curfews. You can go to your uh, you know, workplace and continue producing. So that was a, a positive effect as well. And the vaccination campaign is going uh, you know, uh, relatively well. Uh, my mother has received both of our doses, so she is very happy. I received my first jab, and uh, now we are expecting new batches of uh, uh, deliveries, uh, not only the Chinese vaccine, not only S Sinovac. Well, I myself had uh, the BioNTech uh, one, and now uh, Russian vaccines are also coming to Turkey, and uh, local production efforts are uh, continuing as well. On the negative side, on the uh, not so good side, um, continued uh, depreciation of the uh, local currency, renewed waves of uh, depreciation is uh, affecting everything, uh, not only us consumers, but uh, you know, the whole economy. 
and uh, higher inflation, which was which was 16% uh, as of March, uh, the latest uh, data. Of course, in the uh, long term, uh, you know, uh, this structural impediments for growth, for sustainable growth, need to be addressed. We will need more reforms to improve productivity. Uh, we will need uh, greater stability uh, in the business environment and so on. But uh, as of the uh, moment, uh, this is the situation. And currently, actually, we have uh, just uh, finished uh, a three-week lockdown. Uh, so this had an effect uh, on the economy as well, but also on the tourism, which is very important for Turkey as a revenue generator. Uh, because um, uh, in March and April, we have seen a high increase uh, in new cases, followed by uh, a rapid decline. Uh, so, But uh, this has brought some travel warnings and travel limitations from other countries to Turkey, hence the effect on uh, Turkey. Let me move to the region, because in the post-pandemic uh, world, uh, regional cooperation will be more important, not only for Turkey, but uh, for all the economies around the world. But uh, from the perspective of Turkey, of course, uh, the near neighborhood will be very important, and therefore the Black Sea. Russia is our biggest trading partner, uh, and we have a trade deficit uh, with Russia, but that is very much related to the energy imports. Turkey buys like uh, three thirds, uh, sorry, uh, two thirds uh, of its uh, gas from uh, uh, gas from Russia and one third of its oil from Russia as well. This is one side of the relationship. Uh, on the other side, of course, there is a lot of uh, Turkish investment in Russia as well, um, FDI, uh, Turkish FDI in Russia, but perhaps more importantly, a lot of Turkish construction work in Russia, which are also affected by the pandemic. So they need to resume uh, at full speed. Uh, but uh, let me focus on trade, uh, bilateral trade, uh, both services trade and merchandise, merchandise trade. Services trade, uh, tourism is important and Russia is the largest source of tourists into Turkey. Before the pandemic, 7 million tourists per year, uh, bringing 5 million US dollars to Turkish economy. Uh, last year, it was down to 2 million, but I think it is still good, like 2 million in the pandemic year. Uh, but they need to, uh, you know, go back to the pre-pandemic uh, levels. Uh, but at the moment, we are facing travel bans, uh, so flights are cancelled. Uh, they were supposed to start uh, again on the 1st of June, but now Aeroflot has recently declared that it not, it's not going to happen at least uh, before 30th of June. So one month of summer is now disappearing from the tourism schedule. We will see for the rest. Uh, so the tourism sector is hoping that you know, flights will resume at least uh, end of, uh, end of uh, June. Uh, mer uh, merchandise trade. Now, uh, I'm not going to talk about oil and gas, uh, but food uh, trade is very important between uh, Russia and uh, Turkey. Uh, we are buying grains from Russia and we are selling uh, back uh, fruit and vegetables in return. But this brings us to an important question, a question of connectivity. Now, there are some issues with connectivity in the Black Sea region uh, that uh, you know, uh, the countries have to work on, let me say so. When I think of Russia, Turkey straight with Russia, a major uh, issue is the lack of port capacity. Now, uh, let me tell you one story. Uh, most of the uh, Turkish exports uh, from uh, pro Turkey to Russia was going, uh, let me show you, from the port of Trabzon, you can see on the eastern uh, part of Turkey, to the port of Sochi. You can see that's a very short distance, relatively short distance. But before the Sochi Olympics, uh, the port of Sochi was close to container, uh, uh, container traffic. And it hasn't opened, and um, it's been like seven years since the Sochi Olympics, it hasn't been opened again. So that trade is now going to Novorossiysk. And you can see on the map, it's double the distance, uh, so which is increasing the costs. Now, uh, Russia is investing in port capacities, but uh, this still remains a problem. It's not only about the ports. Uh, if you look at the land trans transportation, we have a problem of uh, permits. You need permits to travel, uh, to take your trucks from Turkey to other countries, and they are limited in numbers. 
Uh, in the case of Russia, uh, this quota is uh, very, very low. It's, it's, it's not sufficient. It's far from, from being sufficient. And this is affecting Turkey's trade with Russia and also Turkey's trade with uh, beyond Russia. Uh, that has to go through Russia. Uh, talking about food uh, trade, uh, and I uh, both Mamuka and Panayotis have mentioned the impact of geopolitics. And uh, Panayotis uh, used a very important, uh, you know, uh, uh, important expression: perceived, uh, perceived weaponization of economics, increase, uh, increasing uncertainties. So we have seen that between Russia and Turkey, uh, and uh, especially sanctions against Turkey in the post-2015 period. Now they were lifted one by one, but some of them are remaining. For example, the biggest problem for the Turkish producer is the remaining sanctions, the remaining limitations on tomato uh, exports to Russia. I'm talking here, by the way, I'm saying it's tomato, but I'm talking about millions of dollars of tomato here. So finally, uh, and well, uh, this is the situation with Russia, but we can talk more like uh, about Ukraine. Uh, just a few words about Ukraine, because uh, the Ukrainian president Zelensky was in uh, Istanbul recently. They talked about three, three things. A free trade agreement, which have been under negotiation for a long time now. Tourism, Ukraine wants to send more tourists to Turkey uh, at a time when Russia is uh, imposing travel bans. And defense industry, because Ukraine is a consumer uh, of uh, a buyer of Turkish drones which takes the whole thing into the geopolitical realm. So, uh, and uh, obviously with all these things uh, going on between Russia and Ukraine and the escalating tension in the Donbass region uh, and so on, uh, Russia uh, doesn't appear to be very happy with the Ukrainian purchase of Turkish weapon systems. And, uh, and this is uh, apparently having an effect. If you ask me perhaps also on the travel ban and on the tourism flows, and uh, yes, with Georgia also connectivity is important. One final thing, uh, and I will conclude with that. Uh, uh, Turkish trade through land routes uh, to the Central Asian region uh, was, taking, uh, was going through Iran, border of Iran, then to Central Asia, Turkmenistan and so on. Now with the pandemic, uh, the border is closed. Now the idea is to shift it to Georgia. Uh, in addition to the railway line, Baku, uh, Tbilisi cars, uh, improving to lay, uh, land tr transportation. And I'm talking about around 40, 40,000 trucks per year. Uh, the idea is to shift it to Georgia, but then again, you face the same problem. They will have to cross to Russia and you need permits uh, for that, you need quotas. So it's not only about infrastructure, it's also about regulations, the rules and this permits and so on. In the post-pandemic period, we will need uh, more improvement in all these areas. Uh, let me stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Altai. Um, we only have um, just a few minutes left. Um, please, for the audience, send us your questions. But let me start um, with, um, with a short round of questions. Um, um, back to Altai um, uh, for just one maximum two minutes um, answer. But my um, question to you is, you started your presentation with um, the idea of regional cooperation as being more important. And, and through your presentation, you've highlighted um, the impediments to regional cooperation, which are, we're going back to geopolitics. I do agree with you that probably the travel ban um, that is affecting Turkish economy is related, um, is related to geopolitics and to the building relationship between Turkey and Ukraine, um, where we see a, a big geopolitical shift of, of Turkey. Um, and so do you, um, in your assessment, my question would be, um, given this emphasis and the need of emphasis on regional cooperation, with the problems that are inherent to Russia as uh, having a, a di diverging view from most Black Sea countries when it comes to cooperation and, and uh, security and prosper prosperity in the region. Um, how do you see um, Turkey's um, uh, uh, regional cooperation development with um, actors like um, Ukraine, um, Georgia, Romania, where it has a strategic partnership? Um, to what extent do you see them as being impeded or developing in the next few years based on geopolitical calculations with Russia in the region? 
Yes, I think I think uh, uh, in the post-pandemic period, uh, economics and economic pragmatism uh, will be in the foreground. Uh, so I will I think we will see more and more efforts to separate politics from the economics to the extent it's possible. It's not always possible, but from the Turkish point of view, uh, you know, in, I mean, I told you uh, about uh, you know the scale of Turkish economic relationship with Russia, and it's definitely important. We depend on Russia for our energy, uh, and uh, but also Ukraine uh, and Georgia uh, in terms of connectivity and so on. They are uh, very much, uh, uh, you know, as important as Russia, perhaps. So in the post-pandemic period, from the Turkish side, I I, I believe in this for the entire world actually. But let me speak uh, from the Turkish perspective. We will see more efforts to diversify relationships, to separate politics from the economics based on mutual interest, based on mutual economic interests and so on, to the extent it is possible. Uh, but I don't see any other way because these are urgent matters uh, because in the post-pandemic uh, period, economics, I mean, will be more important than ever. Uh, so it will be an even finer balancing uh, act in, in the near future. Thank you, Altai. And then um, I'd like to turn over to um, Anthony. Based on, on um, what you've been telling us, um, the key is continuing to build resilience. And, and to me, building resilience means um, good governance, rule of law, um, so that we um, we in the Black Sea can attract more foreign investment from, from the Western side. Um, how how can we think about this given um, given the limitations in in politics and geopolitics? Um, we know that um, foreign direct investment um, can be further developed. We know that the United States has been present in the region, but um, but but uh, limited. And uh, and uh, we know that it has been pushing back, particularly against China, and, and less so against against Russian encroachment on on regional um, economy. How? What are kind of the the keys to thinking about this in a constructive way um, for countries in the region to be able to um, uh, increase regional and and global trade um, with the geo politics uh, issues at hand? Very good question, Julia. So obviously it's a very challenging uh, task. We've got to uh, put together and work together. But I want to emphasize this is time for us to be a bit more practical and strategic. Uh, we've got to do our homework internally and externally. I think we have to expand our space where we can work together, especially with the private sector, uh, companies and think tanks and civil society. I'm more interested in how to making the real connections happen between people and companies. Uh, governance, it's not only just political governance, but we need to really pursue greater economic governance. In order to do that, you cannot really exclude Washington. This is not about you know, one administration versus the other. To me, this is a really build up process. I mean, I don't expect very clean, linear, straightforward line. We'll be always going through zigzagging. So to be more straightforward and simple, your work in Julia in Washington with MEI and Frontier Europe Initiative, I mean, we got to connect these like-minded, willing policymakers, Washington, as well as different parts of Black Sea, how we can really come together with a concrete plan so once again, I want to highlight you know, our work together with a potentially three C's initiative. I think it has to be getting into Black Sea region through Romania and Bulgaria and other countries of the member, three, uh, three C's initiative member. And also let's recognize how we should handle China and the greater issue of supply chain without putting private sector into this thinking. I don't think we're gonna get anywhere. And also this is not an overnight project. This is really medium and long-term project. We gotta really work together. Anthony, thank you. And, and also a quick shout out to um, Heritage. You've have, had lovely words about Frontier and the Middle East Institute, but um, Heritage is doing fantastic work for, for many years. So we're, we're thrilled to work with you and, and others over there in, in building that connection between policymakers here and there. Um, just I just wanna add one more thing, just quickly. So we're on the same page. 
It's time to do more and a lot more to come. That's right. Um, just a very quick um, follow-up question from, from our participants to you, Anthony. Um, does the poor record on rule of law um, or is the poor record um, of rule of law a warning that economic resilience might be difficult to take roots in the region or specific economies in the region? I, I think that's pretty clear. I mean, without foundation of this rule of law, I'm talking about functioning rule of law. How can we make our economic development sustainable? I mean, this is basically building a house on sand without rule of law. So that, that is applicable to any countries on earth, but the Black Sea, we don't have to get into details. We know shortcomings from Turkey. We know shortcomings from Georgia. We know shortcomings from Romania. So the good starting point is that recognizing the situation and try to think and act together how to make it better. So I think that's a good starting point for us to work together. Absolutely. And I would add to that, that it also very much depends on um, governments and their um, and their orientation. And luckily, we see in the region, in Georgia, in Romania currently, even with the changes of government in Ukraine, um, a much more um, opening um, of the of the um, governing um, uh, parties to um, attract foreign investment from that. Um, over to you, Panayotis, um, with a question um, as well from, um, from our um, participants. Um, uh, very quickly. Um, has COVID-19 um, affected the activities or the role of the Black Sea Trade and Development um, Bank in the region? I think it's affected everybody. Um, it would be, it's impossible not to. It's affected us personally in terms of the distance stuff, but it's also forced us to change a little bit the emphasis of what we're doing. We produced um, a strategy that was looking to promote more investment. Um, to focus more on public-private type partnership investments to expand infrastructure and linkages across the region with um, all of that going on hold and for very good solid reasons. I'm not going further. It was not possible in many cases. I'll time mentioned the construction companies in Russia and all of that. Um, you know, you we had to shift the focus. There's a lot more in terms of survival mode, in terms of going through financial institutions to help uh, small and medium enterprises, which it's important to remember that small and medium enterprises are the backbone of most of these economies. Um, even the economies that are bigger in size, a country like Turkey, for example, small and medium enterprises are the back are, are the main predominant type of a uh, corporation and the type of um, employment generator. And that's where you see most of the growth coming up. Some of these very dynamic companies that you've seen over the years, not just there, but I think it's a particularly good example in that way. So um, yeah, we, we did have to shift a little bit. We did a little bit less than we wanted, but we're fine with that. So it did have an impact. On the other hand, the, the slush, the unbelievable flood of liquidity that has come in has probably put the day of reckoning away for some companies um, much further back. Uh, there's a nice article in today's Financial Times about zombie economies in the European Union um, and how the European Central Bank is worried about that. That's not just the European Union that has to worry about There, There's lots of zombies going to be out there all over the place um, without going too far down that um, that mediocre metaphor, if you will. Um, but there clearly will be some sort of a reckoning going forward. And as uh, things tighten up at some point, and they'll have to tighten up in order to get back to a degree of normalcy, we will likely see growth of um, non-performing loans, bankruptcies, all that sort of thing. That can take place against the background of growth. And I think the countries are in a good situation to do that because the financial sectors are not overexposed for the most part. Um, there are some concerns about the Turkish economy and about state-owned banks. Private banks in Turkey have actually proven to be very well run and quite um, solid in what they have done. But there are some concerns there. Um, the rest of the region is uh, is pretty well managed to do that. But these things are never, you know, smooth and linear. Um, Anthony mentioned about the zigzags. You're always going to have the zigzags in anything that you do, whether you're looking at the growth, whether you're looking at the fits and starts in investment in trade or whatever. So um, I, I'm reasonably optimistic about the recovery, but clearly there's room for one step back before you go two steps forward also. Thank you, Panayotis. And, and with um, one minute or two maximum, if we go over time remaining, I'd like to turn to Mamunka with, um, with a follow-up um, in terms of um, uh, investments in the region, particularly private, 
what are the lessons learned from here on? And then one additional question um, from the audience um, um, about um, pro-Western Black Sea countries um, joining the Regional Cooperation Council um, of Southeastern Europe, um, because Ukraine and Georgia haven't yet, if you can comment on that briefly too, but please um, give us your wrap up um, of, of the conversation today. Thank you, Julia. First of all, I would like to thank all our panel participants and also maybe suggest to you and us uh, to uh, consider maybe reconnecting with uh, this group uh, once again about six months and look at uh, expand the sort of maybe horizon of discussion a little bit more. What I've noticed that we had this private discussion with uh, almost all uh, panel participants that Russia is big animal in the room, which is uh, requires obviously more attention from our side in terms of economic uh, perspective of, of Russia's engagement in the Black Sea and with its neighbors and so forth. Uh, Russia needs uh, Black Sea as much as other countries need Black Sea for their trade and export and connectivity to the rest of the world. Largest trade port of Russia and overseas is on, on, on Black Sea and, and beyond. So that's one important element that we need to probably come back and discuss. Uh, I've heard the note about weaponization of the sanctions in discussions, and that's important issue. But also there is this, this background why this is happening. And sometimes we need to kind of look at this as well. We cannot separate uh, 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 some of the economic sanctions and policies related to that, which obviously harms economies with the uh, underlying uh, realities uh, and geopolitical realities that create those type of uh, sanctions. And again, dealing with the root causes is, is, is important. And I think respect of the sovereignty of the nations is important to underline kind of foundation, which will allow us to then build a uh, common economic space. And if, if that that's, uh, principle of sovereignty is respected, Russia could be uh, <laughs> obviously the natural beneficiary of, of this type of uh, economic cooperation with all the parties uh, participating in, in economic development. And one last point, uh, and probably we should, uh, we should discuss this, uh, joining U Ukraine and, and, uh, and uh, Georgia to this uh, Southeastern Economic uh, Alliance group. But uh, one last and most important item uh, is that, as, as Anthony and I we discuss it frequently, of course, these trends are positive. Indexes, improvements are very essential, but ultimately it goes down to facts on the ground, how much new jobs are created, how much new in investments are made, how many new initiatives are made in the private sector that allow larger employment, larger growth and larger economic activities. And this requires uh, much greater improvements in terms of government policies, as well as, uh, as, well as collaboration in, in private public private partnership between government and, and private sector. I think uh, we are all learning. We have lots of uh, bumps on our road, but I think uh, trajectory is, is overall uh, positive and will come out of out of this pandemic stronger, I believe, than than we can. So thank you, Maimuka. I will uh, I will refrain myself from lessons learned. I know I have learned a lot, and it's definitely thank you for pointing that out, Maimuka. It's definitely worth revisiting um, this um, this discussion and these issues in a few months in the context of the post pandemic recovery and assess from there how we can, how we can um, evolve um, or or um, develop regional cooperation, regional trade, um, and and focus particularly on um, on uh, supporting small and, and medium sized companies which is um, something that I would have loved to discuss more today, um, but we have limited time. Um, thank you so much to our distinguished panelists, all of you, um, to your inputs today, uh, um, bringing this conversation to the forefront. Um, as Anthony remarked, there's a lot more that we need to do, um, but I think we're on the right track. Thank you um, to our um, uh, participants for, for attending and for your questions. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon in the future.